Oliver Trolley, nice to see you. Good to see you. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing well. Um, welcome to everyone in the Sophia audience. Uh, my name is Daniel Kaufman. I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University. Uh, and obviously, I uh, host the uh, Sophia program. Uh, used to be pretty much a co-hosting gig with Massimo Piliucci. But you know what's happened is that he and I have done so many of these that we've kind of run out of things to talk about. So um, as I explained to you, I'm trying to get new people, uh, new, new talent, as we might say in the business, um, uh, to, uh, to do these uh, with me. And um, let me just uh, say a few things about your background. Um, you have a, a bachelor's uh, degree from Bard College, uh, which is in the Hudson Valley in New York. Um, you have your master's in philosophy from Tufts University, and you are currently at, uh, in the PhD program in philosophy at Notre Dame. Have I left anything out? No, I mean, there were, there were a few years in there where I didn't do much of anything, but we don't like to talk about them anyway. So oh, so you took it. some time off. Yeah, I, um, yeah, my, my bachelor's degree was in, was in 2008. Then I had a year off where I lived in Brooklyn. Um, and then you did after the whole that, hipster thing, huh? Yeah, well, everybody from Bard, you need to be a hipster for a little while. I t it turned out I'm not really very cool, so I was really bad at it. Oh, you hipsters know, like, aren't cool either. They just figured out how to turn being a loser into being cool. Okay, I'm, well, see, that, that, was the thing. I was just, that was the thing. I was just a loser. So, <laughs> um, And after that, I went to law school for a year. and it was. Oh, um, no, I did not know that. Yeah, and uh, it was after, but I dropped out because I – I decided I didn't want to be a lawyer, and there was no point getting all these loans. Um, what what, I, uh, what changed your mind? I mean, well, it was a it was kind of a complicated situation for me. Um, I think th there were there were a lot of things going on. One was just that I was really most interested in the most philosophical aspects of what we were studying at any given point, um, and those were precisely all my classmates were like oh, geez, I can't wait to stop studying this crap and start studying some actual law. So for me, I mean, one thing I was thinking was just like, wow, I do not necessarily have so much in common intellectually with all these people around me, right? You could have been a constitutional, um, you could have gone into an, like an academic law. That's route, true, right? I could have gone, and it is true that law professors are very well compensated. Um, that's, you know, that's part of the reason why Brian Leiter... Yeah, yeah. When is is working in a law school? Yep. Um, and uh, the same thing with like Jason Brennan, who who teaches at a business school. He said outright, "It's it's just they pay me more to teach business ethics than yeah, I yeah. would be paid to to yeah. supervise graduate dissertations." Yeah. Yeah. Um, so why did you decide not to go that way? Um, I couldn't at that time. I couldn't think of anything in law that would interest me enough to to you know, pers to pursue as a research angle or to write about it. Um, but I was also, you know, I was, I was 22, I think 22 or 23 at the time. And uh, so I was very scattered, um, kind of very confused emotionally at the time. Didn't really know what I was looking for. Um, so, so I ended up did that. It didn't work out. Didn't work out. I ended up going up the street to Tufts. Tufts took a few years longer than I expected because um, I was still kind of a confused person, but um, finished up in Tufts a couple of years ago, uh, applied to PhD programs, and uh, now, uh, well, not now specifically because now I'm at home in Pennsylvania, but just finished my first semester at Notre Dame, uh, which seems to have gone well. Um, so you, you, you're sad... You're satisfied with the course you're on now. You're not, you're not contemplating another, a chain, another change. No, I'm not contemplating another change. Also, I think one thing I realized that I didn't understand when I was younger was that um, life, life doesn't necessarily separate itself into these tracks. You know, I feel like when I was younger, I should have been thinking more about what skills I was building, you know, and which things I was reading and how I was engaging with them rather than like, Oh geez, you know, like if I stay on this track, I'm going to have to live this sort of life. You know, everything was very, I had this very cut and dried 
view of what was going to happen to me when I was younger, that I was just going to be pushed along some Do you some think road. that that's, you know, as you say that, I mean, that was how I thought of it. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm wondering if the reason why it's important not to think that way now is because the economy's changed so much. In other words, you can't count on lifetime careers. Is that sort of, is that sort yeah, of, so, I mean, that way? this is, um, yeah, this is certainly, I, uh, I think this is part of it that certainly, um, even if you wanted to be on a track, you really, it's not going to be a hundred percent even coming from a top law school or a top philosophy PhD program or something like that. Um, so it's, why, it's wiser to cultivate a skill set that you can yeah. deploy in multiple career tracks. But also, I mean, I think another part of it is just, it's a part of the, the way I like to, to think of myself. You know, I don't, I think I realized as I got older that I, I don't like to think of myself as like Oliver Trolley, comma, lawyer or Oliver Trolley, comma, philosopher. I'm just, you know, like I contain multitudes. I have, you know, I have uh, a broad array of of skills, hopefully. Um, so I, I, but do. are you planning on pursuing a traditional academic well, track? In other words, you're going to get a PhD, go on the job market, try and get a job I would, professor. Is that your plan? I would certainly love to be able to teach in a philosophy department. Um, that would be, that would make me really happy. Um, I'm moving towards that um uh you know one semester down nine nine or eleven or however many to go um that's definitely what i would like to do i uh, in terms of traditional work but i also i have these you know i have these op-eds i write i i have or maybe not op-eds but you know i write essays online i have um you know, interest in creative writing and stuff like that. And uh, I, my hope is to keep trying to pursue a variety of things and not, you know, so you have, you have, a, you have a bit of a presence of, as a public intellectual. Am I correct? I mean, you, yeah, actually, publish, I would, you actually publish in some real places, right? I mean, um, yeah, kind of real. Yeah. I, I, um, meaning not people's blogs necessarily, but like yeah. actual organs, right? I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I've been, I, I've been paid for my writing. That's right. Um, what are some of the I, venues you've been published? You, you've published. Yeah, published? I've been, I've been published. Uh, so in October I had a three day span, which was really great where I was published in um, commentary and American affairs and tablet magazine. Um, in the past, I've also been published in places like um, Quillette magazine and Ario Mag- magazine, arc digital um, national review online uh, and a few others. Um, so and you want, you want to keep doing that. You want that, that kind of work you find satisfying. You want to keep doing that as well. Yeah, I mean, I like what I found when I started. Do, so I started doing that online writing. Um, I had writer's block for a lot of my life that I, that I had difficulty dealing with. Um, and I finally kind of dealt with it during a, a time in my life when I was quite down emotionally. Um, And the first thing I ever published online was for Quillette magazine. And it was a rundown of an event you may remember. Um, A philosopher named Rebecca Tuvel had published an article on a phenomenon. You know, you may think it's a phenomenon. You may think it's not a phenomenon. um, A concept called transracialism uh, in Hypatia, uh, a feminist philosophy journal. And there was a huge backlash to it. Um, and my article, my article for Quillette was, you know, it had a kind of very fiery beginning and ending where I said, look, you know, philosophers need to sort their stuff out. You know, we need to figure out how to deal with these sorts of ideas. (coughs) You know, the main, the main substance of the article was just like, it's not such a bad essay. Um, you know, it's not, there wasn't anything so wrong with what Tuvel said. She made logical arguments and, Every everything that people are criticizing her for is something she already addressed in her paper. Um, so you know what what happened after that was um, people actually read it, which I hear is not something that always happens when you publish in academic journals. Um, 
And, uh, <laughs> you're, being, you're being uh you're being a little dry dry there, aren't you? <laughs> a little I mean, bit. It is well um, known how few people read. <laughs> um, right. Um, but what <laughs> I found, my, that was one of my frustrations with it. Yeah. You know, if it you know when you realize that you know an essay I did on you know uh, uh, trans women in sports for my own magazine, you know got. <sighs> You know, had ten thousand readers, right? And where are you going to get ten thousand readers? Some academic paper yeah. that I published in a very prestigious journal. I mean, I published in some of the top journals. You realize, you know, if a hundred people read it, you're lucky. Yeah, it's probably more like twenty. Um, yeah, it really kind of re makes you sort of it gives you pause. And there's a weird quality to it, right? Too, because I mean, generally, my understanding is what happens is a lot of the people who are going to be the ones who actually end up reading it, you've already circulated it to them for comp like before it's published, you already know exactly the people in the world who are going to have an interest in these ideas. You've already talked to them at conferences. You've already circulated your draft to them. Um, so yeah, I got very uh, addicted. Isn't quite the word, but I got very uh, interested in reproducing the feeling of, yeah. of having people actually read me and um yeah. you know at first i would i didn't like the feeling of people you know there's always somebody on twitter or or facebook or somewhere who says you know who wrote this crap you know yeah, this people idiotic, after you, know. you you're getting mobbed yeah um, but uh what i found is that i i kind of like that too you know like bring it on uh is my current view yeah. Um, yeah, you know that that a lot of that depends upon how how much you care about your professional. In other words, you know, yeah. with me, it's it's actually my greatest nightmare because you know you you know I've got a career, I've right. got a family. Um, you know, people can fuck up my shit, right? Yeah, really badly. Now, if I was single and just you know on my own, I'd probably you know be out spoiling for a fight all over the place. Yeah. Um, um, but now I'm sort of, I have a much, I'm much more risk averse, uh, you know, yeah. which is why every time I publish one of these things, I do have like a day or two of sort of like, like terror uh -huh. Oh wow! as to, as to whether I'm going to just get sort of massacred and it's going to get back to my wife or to my, you know, cause you know, my wife is a school teacher. She's on Facebook. Well, let me tell you why you don't need to worry about that so much. Cause <laughs> I think now we, what I tell people I've actually said this in all seriousness to people who, who seemed to be, you know, threatening to go down that route to me. If somebody were to do that to me right now, I think my best response would just be to go, you know, James Damore, the guy who got fired from Google, right? So whether or not what he wrote was correct or not, like that may have been the best thing that ever happened to him. Like if you think about his life now, he instantly made like, a hundred thousand dollars. People just threw money at him. They were like, "Thank you for writing this thing. Thank you for getting fired. You're a martyr." He goes on speaking tours. He has suddenly he went from being like probably one of the nerdiest, most socially awkward people at one of the nerdiest, most socially awkward workplaces in the world. He went to being this this immense public figure with hundreds of thousands of followers, um, and I. Uh, Maybe maybe he liked being the mild mannered programmer, um, but it's hard for me to see. So that's what I tell people. I say if I were if somebody went after me in that way, I would just I would go full full victim. You know, I would go. They're censoring me. My free speech is being silenced. Um, it's still a uh, risky game, though. I mean, you know, of course it is. Sure they, no, they, no, no question. Money, they may throw money at him, but you know what happens? You know. What if his wife and his kids are covered on his health insurance that's through his job? You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of sort of. Certainly, you know, it's not. It's not. <laughs> it's it's very risky. I'm just saying that from from my position, um, like you said, uh, not you know nobody depends on me financially, and it's good that they don't because I make twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> it's good they don't because you're uh, as, a, as a graduate student. <laughs> yeah, um, but. Um, yeah, I think uh, it, it would be. I think it would be interesting what would happen next after yeah. that, and just yeah. how how loudly I could sound the horn and uh, and develop yeah. that persona.
Yeah, and, and you know, it's actually this is this was totally this is sort of unscripted. I mean, I do have sort of an outline for us, uh-huh. um, but this is a perfect way into what we're right, going to yeah. talk about today, which is so we're going to talk about the sort of the, the the current state of philosophy. Now, I already did one of these with Justin Weinberg, who's uh-huh. the editor of Daily News, and my guess yeah. is he and I don't. Well, no, no, no. It's actually, it's not like that at all because I, with him, scrupulously stayed away from the political side of it. Uh-huh. I only talked to, with him about it in terms of the um, job market, mm-hmm. the, the 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 closing of departments, the the just the sort of the the the, the sort of the, the the mad sort of STEM obsession, so that all the mm-hmm. humanities and liberal arts. Again. I stayed away from the political side of it with him because. I knew that he and I categorically disagree about almost all of it. Right. And that it would probably not be a very productive discussion. You know, there have been, there are people with whom I can have productive discussions with whom I completely right. disagree. He doesn't strike me as one of them. And that's going to come up later. Um, you know, uh-huh. and when, we, when we talk about uh, philosophy um, uh, in the blogosphere, the blog, yeah, the blog, uh, social media. Yeah. but, but, what I want to get from you, so so he's a professor. He's part of the establishment, very mm-hmm. much part of the establishment, albeit the sort of new establishment, which I guess we'll probably talk about. And um, <coughs> you're a graduate student, mm-hmm. and um, so you're seeing it from the other side, from the from from another side, also an insider's pr- perspective, but a very different one. <coughs> and you, you seem to have pretty heterodox views. So I mean. For the audience' uh, sake, the way I came to find uh, Oliver was in the comment section at the Daily News, and where I no longer where I no longer participate, uh, which we'll discuss later. Um, but when I was participating there, I would see you a lot, and you 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 struck me as uh, thoughtful and incredible, thoughtful, independent, and incredibly patient in the sense that. I never once saw you escalate or react um, to, to, to sort of a provocation. You, you seem tremendously in control of yourself. And so I thought well, you'd be a good you. per- at least in that venue. I mean, maybe uh, elsewhere you go off, but there I've never seen you go off. And um, so I thought you'd be a great person to pick your brain on, on mm-hmm. what, what, the, the, what philosophy looks like from the grad student's perspective right now. <clears throat> and um, so that's why I'm having you on. So we're going to talk about the state of philosophy. We are going to talk th- about the political state of it uh-huh. in a way I did not with Weinberg. Uh, although feel free to talk about any of the other, the job prospects aspect of it, any aspect of it that you want. And I guess the way I was, I thought we would start is for you mm-hmm. just to sort of talk a little bit about your experience at Tufts and now at Notre Dame and, and what are the things you're noticing? What are the things you're seeing? What's the culture like? Yeah, so um, it's interesting. I don't really – I would be lying if I said that my impression of philosophy as politicized is something that has been really borne out in my experiences at Tufts and Notre Dame. Um, meaning, they, pers- meaning personally, you're not – you've not in the venue yeah, and seen this it, happen. It's, yeah, it's really interesting because when I go online and when I read – when I read – the Stone, which I wrote uh, an article about in the National Review Online over the summer, um, or, you know, when I read all these blogs, it seems like you said the thing about STEM. You know, obviously there's this idea that philosophy should be the, the handmaid into science, but it seems to me that a lot of philosophers think right now that philosophy should be like the handmaid into a certain kind of progressive politics. Um, but that's not – that's something that – my impression of that is almost entirely from – uh, from what I've observed uh, in blogs, what I've heard from friends, I hear from a lot of friends at top schools. They say it's incredibly politicized here. People talk about, you know, a, a friend at, at, at a top school <clears throat> said that he heard a, a fellow student say something about, you know, just h- how many of the rich should we slaughter? You know, like this is like a, an ethics quandary for applied ethics or something. Um, I've never actually encountered anything too much like that. Of course, you know, Tufts and Notre Dame were kind of, are kind of interesting in their own ways. Of course, Tufts, a lot of people who come to Tufts come for Dan Dennett. 
there's a sort of uh, overarching skepticism of of metaphysics and a, uh, an approach to the philosophy of mind that I don't always agree with. Um, then Notre Dame is kind of almost in the opposite direction. Um, but I, Notre, Notre Dame is one of the few places where where there are some very powerful, uh, well known conservative. Uh, yeah. Philosophers. In other words, <coughs> it's a place you can be conservative in. <coughs> yeah, certainly. And, uh, a, a lot of people there really love Alistair McIntyre. Yeah, he's a um, giant. I mean, he's a giant. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and it's a Catholic school, and I'm assuming he's exactly. not. I'm assuming he's not the only one. No, no, certainly not. Um, not you know uh, when I when I visited at Notre Dame in March, um, and I don't even think of myself as a conservative, but probably at this point, everybody else in the world does. Well, you'll um, get called one. I mean, I mean, at this point, yeah. at this point, if you're like a sort of a liberal in the style of John Stuart Mill, you're going to get called a conservative. Yeah, and that's what conservatives um, tell me is just like come in, the water's warm. And it, it's surprising to me because I would think, you know, why why would liberals be pushing me away? But that's, you know, that's life. Um, when I was, so two things, two interesting events. When I was there in March, um, and I said I wrote online and I was being very shy about where I write for because I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to uh, alienate anybody just by saying I write for Quillette or I write for National Review. Um, and, uh, a girl there said to me, look, it's okay. You can be out here. Meaning this is the, this is like the one place that you can openly espouse conservative beliefs and people will, um, kind of take you as, you know, as you come. Uh, and it is something I've heard, like I said, I've heard from people at, at other top schools or, you know, or at, you know, schools that are more highly ranked than Notre Dame, that it's not a comfortable place to, to say anything remotely conservative at the moment. Um, I will say that when I, when I got to school in August at our very first department mixer, um, somebody came up to me. I'm friends with him now. I, he was half joking, but philosophy students can be very awkward, right? Um, yeah. I, he, he came up to me and it seems and, to be uh, more and more. So, I mean, I don't know. It seems to me like, I, I thought I saw a study about the rate of mental illness or something and probably very high. And I, I have to say that it's much more so than when I was in graduate school or when I was uh, in college. I mean, it almost seems like philosophy more and more is selecting for, for, you know, the creep factor seems, <laughs> to, be, seems to be, you know, you know, more and more philosophy seems to be entirely populated yeah. by people who when I was in high school would have been routinely beaten up by jocks. Right. <laughs> um, whereas that really wasn't the case huh. when I was in graduate school um, or even when I was in college, so I was in, I was in college huh. in the eighties uh, and in graduate school in the nineties. And it really still wasn't quite such a freak show. Um, I mean, uh -huh. it was, I will say this though. I mean, it was it was pretty inhospitable to conservatives, uh -huh. so much so that so at the time I actually was a full blown conservative. Mm -hmm. I had my own column in National Review when I was twenty six, and I'm talking about in the mm -hmm. print magazine. There was no online yet. Very cool. And um, and I got it just by pitching an idea to William F. Buckley, and he invited me to have lunch with the editors. I mean, that's how it went. And um, I did it for about a year and a half, and then they had a major change in leadership. John O'Sullivan went. To, uh, step back and rich Lowry mm -hmm. took over and rich Lowry changed everything. And I was, I was cut out, but, um, well, that sounds like an interesting story right there, but, but you know, oh, it was, and I was at mm -hmm. the time very brash and I, I thought I was cut out for pretty bad reasons. And I wrote a pretty hostile letter to William uh -huh. Jr. Which I got a, an indignant reply. I should have kept all of this stuff. I didn't, I didn't, uh -huh. actually. but anyway, I was doing this. And at the time there was one professor at the CUNY graduate center, which I was at, I won't mention mm -hmm. his name. Actually, I will because he actually published an essay on the APA blog where he talked about it, Stephen Kahn. Uh -huh. And he, um, who I think most people, if they know who he is in philosophy, is as a publisher of, a, a publisher of anthologies. Mm -hmm. um, I think his are the most used philosophy anthologies, you know, for mm -hmm. intro classes and stuff like that. Anyway, he flat out told me that I should hide, that I should right. not tell anyone. Now, back then, you could hide because unless these people actually went and bought National Review and read it, there's no way that there was no internet, right? And so you didn't just find things out 
And it was very unlikely that any of these people was going to be read. Any of the people who would punish uh -huh. me for it would ever read National Review, right? Right. And so I was effectively able to kind of hide. Um, and, and that was back in the mid-90s, right? And mm -hmm. so um, I, from what I'm told by everyone, it's a thousand times worse now. Because of oh the, yeah now I mean of, because of the internet now they would just Google you and they would find your columns. I mean I think here's the interesting thing though I think for me at least when I think about the job market which of course is still a few years away and I need to you know I need to get a yeah, I mean are you going to have all, what are you going to do you go on the job market and there's all this stuff that these people are going to say is right wing. I'm just going to I think for me like the thing is that having like a uh, a sterile, polished, perfect resume with the the two publications, the top ten journals, and the top ten or twenty PhD. That like that isn't enough to get you a job now, anyway. Like, there's no that doesn't guarantee you. No, of a, course, a, not. A, you know, a job teaching philosophy these days. So I view it more as like I'm kind of. At least I rationalize it to myself this way, um, even though I'm probably not doing it for this reason. But um, I'm going to have, you know, by the time I graduate, I'm going to have a very unique public profile. And uh, I think there will probably be a lot of departments to whom it's off-putting. But I also know, you know, like I got your email. I get emails from other people. I know there are people yeah. who say, you know, like, you're putting it out there and we, and we appreciate that. And I know that, like you say, I try when I'm talking to philosophers online, no matter how, how dumb some of the stuff they say. And I, I can be very surprised at how, just how poorly argued, you know, very well established philosophers. And I know it's just the internet. It's just comments on a blog. And I've been commenting on blogs since I was like seven years old or something. And it's not true for many of these people, but, um, but anyway, I, I think that there are people who will will see something they like there, and that to me is it's a high risk, high reward strategy. But um, I know that just keeping my head down is no is no longer you know in the post two thousand eight economy. There's no guarantee that I would yeah. that I would have a career as a philosopher just just towing the line and keeping yeah, and my I'm head not, down. I'm not I'm not suggesting that you should do other yeah, yeah no. no. You know, I've got a, I've got a, uh, I know people. I mean, I've got one friend who just, um, you know, one of the, one of the super, super intense social justice professors in the department uh -huh. has just decided that he is not sufficiently woke and has, has, has got, you know, pursued a sort of a, 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 a aggressive and sustained effort to pretty much destroy him socially in the uh -huh. department. I mean, this is, faculty just, just directly pr predating upon uh -huh. students right um um this funny, thing, a grad funny thing is funny thing is if she'd sleep if she slept with them she'd be fired right uh -huh. but if she does uh -huh. everything she can to ruin him right she'll get an award right for the from the from the from the local um you know feminist collective yeah um, faculty climate Improving faculty climate um, by, you know, by I mean, not. I mean, to the point of poisoning the water, going and trying to convince all the other students to hate him. Uh -huh. um, <coughs> excuse me. That's terrible. So just really, I mean, I'm just, I'm hearing a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Then I'm seeing the stuff that happened to, to Rebecca Tuvel, which I find to be just absolutely incredible. By this point, I think most of the people in the audience actually do know the story because it's been right. brought up a number of times in, in dialogues on blogging heads, not just by me. Um, there's now, I mean, there's, abs there's an absurd thing going on now. I mean, maybe we'll get to, the, maybe we should wait till we get to talking about uh, 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 blogging. But the, Rachel McKinnon is actually in a major fight online with Martina Navratilova. With Martina I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, it's just like, yeah, you know, I now, saw you that. now have philosophy professors who aren't satisfied to just try to destroy each other. They're now trying to destroy like legendary athletes, right? So, I mean, Rachel McKinnon is out. Um, you know, making it's funny also, you know, that people, people are so unself-aware that they don't realize that they are just making complete fools out of themselves that, yeah. that, that, they're, that they're embarrassing themselves to such a degree. And that with every time you point it out, they double down even more and embarrass them. I mean, and but that's, she's, I mean 
She's going yeah. after. She's accusing Martina Navratilova of being a transphobe. Yeah, that was. I saw that conversation on Twitter. It was really incredible, and it's it's crazy to me how. I mean, regard. <laughs> I don't even want to take. I don't know much about McKinnon. I don't want to get into the political issues, but reading that conversation, it's very hard for me to see how anyone. She just comes across as like a very cruel and like not not nice you know like a very mean and hurtful person and this is this is one of the comments oh, pride had- and prideful i mean she had yeah. the nerve to say to i mean martina navratilova is arguably the greatest women's tennis player to ever play the game she came out as gay very early mm-hmm. um when that was not an unrisky thing to do um um and She's, you know, Rachel McKinnon says to her, don't you know who I am? I'm a world <laughs> champion because Rachel McKinnon won some cycling race where she yeah. had a bunch of women. And I think <laughs> right? she said, I think she said, I, I mean, think McKinnon wrote, I think she wrote, do better. Right. To, to now, And it's just like, that is not, and that, I think that, that's what I, I worry about about philosophy. That the current cast I think we're in serious of tr- philosophy. You can't just go around saying "do better." You know, it's not my place to educate. You. Like it is, if you have if you have something clear to say, then I, you know I'm not against Rachel McKinnon making some some brilliant argument with regards to these issues, e- even in engaging with Martina Navratilova, but. Make it make an argument. There's there was nothing there was nothing philosophical about that engagement. No, it's just go um, ahead and read my book or read my article. Yeah, it's so it's <clears throat> petty and it's and it's cruel. And I think that I don't even what the the people who I'm really worried about, like number one in philosophy right now. Like, of course, there are there are there are true believers, and if they're wrong about their theories then they need to be disabused of their notions. And that, but that's true of any philosophical theory, right? What, what gets to me is that there are these people who, the, the social, because it has such a, it, it, it allows people to gain the moral high ground in such obs- obscure ways, or to think they have the moral high ground, it enables a lot of just pettiness and cruelty in ways that I think, um, people who are not in the discipline or who are not even, who are not in this part of the discipline find it difficult to anticipate, like just how quickly somebody can be ostracized, just how many words there are for, Oh, you know, like, Oh, you're enabling fascism or you're colonizing, you're colonizing the space or, you know, philosophy. is One of the things that's happening that I think is, and I wrote about, I wrote an essay about this. Um, the essay was just called "Stop It," and uh-huh. um, and that that's actually one that that got it got picked up on several feeds and stuff, and and so a lot of people read that one. And one of the, really what I think is happening, it's pretty blatant, is that philosophers are just flat out, deliberately, cynically, disingenuously abusing the harm principle. Okay, uh-huh. they're just going out and claiming harm when there demonstrably is none. Or at least yeah. none in a relevant sense, right? I mean, anything. I mean, you, anything where you feel unpleasant, you could claim as having been harmed. But we're talking about harm in the sense that it's legitimate to go about and prevent other people from speaking, right? Or deprive people of their livelihood, or get people into into vast various sorts of trouble. And they're just flat out abusing the harm principle. I mean, I can't, if, you, if you read that exchange between McKinnon and Mar- Martina, mm-hmm. and I, I mean, McKinnon repeatedly says that Martina's harmed her. How? Yeah. How? Have you been harmed, right? You stop lying to everybody in their face, right? Yeah. I mean, and it's, and it's there absolutely, are... it's, and, no, and I see it all the time. It, it, I've, what worries me the most about philosophy right now is the character of the people doing it. Mm-hmm. I think that the, that our current wave of stars, I think they're just bad people. They're just flat out bad people. And they're poisoning, the, the social media allows them to poison the entire space, 
right? And so the decent ones are all sort of like hiding their cubbies and just do their technical work and don't touch these topics, right? Yeah, I definitely, so that is definitely something that I agree with. That there's, there is an enormous silent majority yes. of philosophers and of course, you know, I grew up liberal. I'm still a liberal. I the the phrase "silent majority" has negative connotations to me. But me too, and I'm older than you. That really resonates with me when I hear that that expression. But it's but true. I think I, that, I mean, yeah, there's this enormous, and people are just like, I don't, I don't want, <coughs> I, I don't want to deal with this. I want to do my, you know, I have. I'm working on my paper on characterizing modal logics or on. You know, on how this argument relates to that argument, and it's great. And that's you know, that's the sort of work I want to do as well. But it's 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 amazing to me that people don't. I mean, people are concerned, but they don't. I think they they don't want to be the ones to take on the risk um, of of engaging with this kind of hot molten core of just anger that there is in some of the most prominent people in the district. You know, I don't mind the anger. What I mind is the dishonesty. Uh -huh. What I mind is the sort of the um, the by whatever means necessary tactics, right? Right. Um, um, you know, you know. The other thing, I guess that you know, if I would say there's two giant lies that are very common amongst this this strata philosopher. One is the abuse of the, the lying about the harm, but the lying that one has been harmed, mm -hmm. and the other um, is is lying about about the the magnitude of the issue. Um, right. I'm sorry. I just I just you know. Uh, I mean, you've got you've got literally uh, you, you you you've got a human catastrophe going on in Yemen. Don't tell me that the fact that somebody refuses to call you Zer is a serious issue that everybody should get worked up about and be up in arms about. I mean, that tells me that you've got you don't have enough to do, right? Um, 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 and and I also think they know that too. I think that's disingenuous, also. Yeah, um, I definitely um, think that in. At the very least, in in an ethicist, you know, in somebody who's a professional ethicist, to not be able to weigh to make or distinctions those things, to make those sorts of distinctions. But this is something that I wrote it in at the end of my Tuvel article, which was it was like I said, it's the first thing I wrote. It's very, you know, it's um kind of raw and unedited and stuff. But um, it's actually very we've we have a habit now of phrasing every interest in terms of as a right, you know, in, in phrasing anything that could, that could help somebody um, as, as a kind of right. And when it comes to balancing one right against another right, um, I don't know if we have such a, like, it's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to know how to do. Um, the, I think a lot of people's intuitive concepts of right is that if you have a right to something, then it's kind of like prima facie inalienable. But then if every, you know, if everything we could want is something that we have a right to, um, or if every possible harm is something that we have a right, you know, we have a right to not be harmed in all of these new testimonial harms and hermeneutic harms and epistemic harms and so forth. Um, well, very, very quickly, you're going to have a situation where you have dozens and dozens of rights on one side. If you take one course of action, that will be violated, and dozens and dozens of rights on the other side that will be violated if you take the other course of action. Um, and the whole rights language uh, makes it very difficult uh, to evaluate this because it seems like it seems like you're in a par paralysis where you've um, where you've violated something inalienable. Yeah. Um, no matter what you do. But you know, I mean, what you said about the harm principle is correct. But the way the way they get around it is by by coming up with these new theories of, oh, well, you harmed me in an epistemic sense, right? Right. The, by, the, the, I the gave you my testimony, and you right. didn't. But this, the problem so is, but the problem is that in our system, you have no you have no right not to be harmed in that way. Well, but you the, you want you want to change that? Go to the fucking legislature and change it. But don't get here online and act like it's already happened because it hasn't, right? It the hasn't. thing is, I mean, it, and it, you're cer I certainly agree with you, but there's a question to which, like, maybe de facto within the philosophy professor, profession, um, they have, you know, maybe they have changed it de facto. Like, maybe, maybe what we're worried about to an extent is 
they've won and there are these new norms where you need yeah. to be, you know, I thought, and the wake of the Tuval thing, I won't name the philosopher in question, but you can probably, you know, it would probably be one of your first guesses. Um, there was some of the people criticizing Tuval had called her um, Becky. Now, Becky is a kind of slang For insult. Rebecca, it's, like, it's, like, it's, like, it's like what you call your six-year-old friend whose name is Rebecca. She goes by Becky. Right? But, there's also, but there's also in, um, in I think, in uh, there's a, 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 Becky is like a, an insult for white women among black women. Is it really? Um, yeah. And so, and so, that and in the, in the comments of a, of a, of a post on the feminist philosophers blog, somebody got, said somebody else was practicing what they called white ignorance for not knowing that Becky was this very specific kind of insult. And they, they said something like, I don't see how you can be a philosopher without listening to Beyonce or something like that. And it was just, I was like, it was like the craziest thing. <coughs> what could listening to Beyonce possibly have to do with being a philosopher? Like that was just crazy to me. And yet this is the avenue. This is the avenue that a lot of people are taking that you need to, philosophy should be close to, to pop culture and to the, to the, concerns of of you know to the concerns of the the 18 to 21 year old students that we have um in our colleges and that's it seems to me like where i mean i don't always model this perfectly but it seems to me that we should be the adults in the rooms and we should be able to say i'm you know i'm the ethicist i tell you i don't just buy into the concerns that you tell me you have I tell you which concerns are important and which ones are not. You know, that's that's the job is being able to make that sort of decision. It's difficult to say whether this is being led from the down bottom up or from the top down because I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm inclined, you know, to think that the students wouldn't be quite so emboldened in this way if an awful lot of the faculty weren't. um, No, certainly the faculty weren't 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 pipering. You know, I mean, sort of and administrators. You know, I was going to ask you, you know, have you seen it, 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 either at Tufts or Notre Dame within the departments? Have you seen, you know, let's, let me give me just a sort of a stupid example, but you, you'll see, you, you, can, you could take it as an analogy or a metaphor. <clears throat> um, you know, do you have like super feminist or whatever uh, uh, race critical theorists working at Notre Dame who will sit there and bash McIntyre as a racist and a, and a, and a, and a, and a misogynist and a this, that, or the other, um, um, or, or are people like him just too big to, 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 to do that to in a place no. like Notre Dame? So Notre Dame does have, and I was a little surprised by this, just given the, the nature of the department, Notre Dame does have a Janet Karani, who's a feminist <laughs> philosopher of science and writes about, you know, I disagree with her about basically everything. She writes about how, you know, science is values based and she writes about what she calls like epistemologies of ignorance or something, which is about how like, um, you know, maybe it's better not to study some topics because studying them, you will, you know, you'll in studying, out. you'll find out things you don't <laughs> want to know, right? you find out something you don't to want me, to know. Yeah. To me, that seems like an admission of, you know, that seems like just giving up the game. But, but interpersonally, Everything I've seen from her just at department events and everything I've heard about her, very nice person, does not – I've never seen her. She's a her serious speak. person. She's not – Yeah. And these views are – and I think that's an important thing to separate. And that's something I sometimes worry about in, you know, in the, the kind of, like, heterodox academy or intellectual dark web, like, spheres that I engage in online, is that sometimes, like, there are – there, there are people who engage in this sort of mobbing and those people, I think you need to think in a kind of real politic way about how to deal with them. But then there's also people who just, they're saying, well, why wouldn't science be value-based, you know, or why couldn't there be an epistemic harm? And in, when, you know, in that situation, you need to come up with a counter argument. And it's, I think it's very important to be able to recognize which sort of, kind of opponent you have whether you're having the opponent who's trying to engage with you intellectually and you need to come up with a response versus the sort of opponent who's saying 
we're just going to crush you. We're going to make sure you can't get a job. We're going to delete your comments. You know, we're going to make sure you can't publish in, right. in the Atlantic or the New Yorker or wherever. And we're just going to kind of push you out of the discourse. Um, to me, it's really, really important to try to make accurate judgments about which sort of interlocutor I have. That's an interesting point. I mean, so in a sense, what you're saying is that you're concerned that the pushback, the resistors, the, the, the heterodox academies, uh -huh. the intellectual dark web, which I have to admit, I really don't have any use for. Uh -huh. um, I, I just am not really very impressed by Jordan Peterson. Um, um, yeah, I, I reviewed his book Sam in American Harris, Affairs. Yeah. Harris or, um, but that, not, that's not a hero there. Um, right. Um, I mean, I had Brian Leiter on specifically <laughs> to talk about the relationship of Marxism to identity politics because Peterson just is constantly talking about this. You know, so, you know Marxist and Leiter yeah. says, no, actually Marxists hate identity politics. He doesn't, he literally does not know what the hell he's talking about. Right. Right. Um, he just goes out and spew, spews a bunch of crap. Right. I mean, it might be out of some certain Frankfurt school ideas, um, um, but even there, it's not like he ever says it's, anything serious about Horkheimer or, or, yeah. or anything. Anyway, so, but it sounds to me like what you're saying is, look, you know, we we're kind of reacting in a way that's indiscriminate, right? I mean, that that on the one yeah. hand, there are people, this, the warriors out there in the blogosphere trying to destroy everyone, like this 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 professor, this trans professor at Goldsmiths in UK, mm -hmm. who was running a Facebook. Uh, a, a Facebook page devoted to organizing people to get people fired, including yeah. my friend Kathleen Stock, right? Who's, who's at the University of um, of Sussex? Um, who in normal in normal situations, Kathleen Stock is somebody who he's a super would, left wing feminist, completely right? I mean, be on the opposite side oh, of. I mean, hold on a second. I'm just, I'm just opening a window. It actually has gotten really warm. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the, you know, the irony. I mean, Kathleen Stock is a lesbian activist, super left wing. Um, I know her through aesthetics, and so she and I have never engaged each other politically because that's mm -hmm. just not the sphere we know each other in. I know her through going to British Society of Aesthetics meetings for, right. you know, years and giving papers. And because um, that's her main area is philosophy uh, and liter philosophy of literature, actually. And, and she's an excellent philosopher. Mm -hmm. And um, so probably she and I would disagree about almost everything or a lot of things. But I simply, you know, I'm not going to watch one of my friends get fucking dismantled, right? Yeah. So anyway, so you have the people who are doing that sort of thing. But then you have the people like the professor you just mentioned who they're just doing very, very radical progressive scholarship. Mm-hmm. But they're not going out and trying to ruin their enemies. They're not trying to get. But let me ask you about this, though. Let uh -huh. me push you a little bit on this. Okay. This is something I was actually going to say anyway, and, and, and I just wanted to get your impression. To what extent, though, does that kind of political orientation actually corrupt the scholarship itself? And, and here's, here, here's where I'm getting at, Okay. And I'll give you an example. It's one about which there was just a, it, it's just currently in the news now. So uh, Peter Ludlow wrote one of the most scathing book reviews I've ever read. Yeah. Of put, Jason, I, Stan yeah. Jason Stanley's book on fascism. It's a terrific review. It put mine to shame. Now, Jason Stanley is a major top professor. He's at Yale. He's a major social justice type. He's in with all these. He's, 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 whenever there's an IQ squared debate about whether there should mm -hmm. be free speech, he's on the, no free, yeah. the anti-free speech side of it, right? I mean, now, that book. Or he's on the side that says there's no problem or something like that. <laughs> right. That book, I've read the book, published on a, on a serious university press, mm -hmm. is such a work of hackery is such an embarrassment, embarrassing performance, right? I mean, it is the most unveiled, undisguised, simply using the scholarship to try and basically discredit anyone on the political right in the United States. That's what he's trying to do. He's basically trying to argue that here's what fascism is, fascism is, here's how it becomes fascism, and oh, look, all those Republicans... Yeah, isn't, fascists, it, convenient? Right? isn't it convenient that the libertarians... Yeah, so there were... 
I didn't. Um, it's an embarrassing book. I cannot believe a publisher published it. I could, can't be, imagine that if you inver inverted the political orientation, that any academic publisher would have published it, right? If so, if somebody had written a book like oh, that, oh, well, certainly not. Certainly right? not. I'm saying that, that all the Democrats are, are 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 basically you know North Korean Marxists, right? Um, they would never have published it. <laughs> and and so I guess what I'm asking is, does a certain intensity of political orientation actually corrupt the scholarship itself. And so it's very nice that your, your professor in that department isn't mm -hmm. going around trying to get people's jobs taken away from them. But is, well, she, is she debasing the quality of, of, of philosophy by, by, pub, by publishing what is essentially partisan hackery well, in academic guise? Here's, I think this is, where, this is where I start to agree with Heterodox Academy, where I say the problem isn't when one person has their partisanship the problem is where everyone is partisan in the same direction right and there's no there's no pushback there's no dialogue so one thing i didn't have ne necessarily quite as negative a, uh, an opinion of stanley's book as you did although i you did write it you didn't agree with ludlow's review ludlow's review was was good um but he like I, said, I, mind, I wrote i wrote my own negative review of the book in commentary um although i didn't I mean, the the great part about Ludlow's review was he just had so the details about Mussolini, and about but there was actually a similar moment in my review where I talk about um, you know uh, Stanley has like a Steve Bannon quote, which he characterizes in some way, but it's clear that Bannon is just like talking about Bannon is like referring Stanley says something like oh Bannon's t Bannon's talking about how how great the 1930s were while well, what happened in the 1930s fascism. But actually the Bannon quote is about like FDR like style, like new deal programs. So it's not like, there's no, you know, it's just, it's a, it's not a very good characterization. Um, there was a, another thing um, like that, which I think Ludlow and I cottoned on to the same quote. The, I think the, the very, the very worst thing in the book we agreed on was, um, where Stanley says um, the idea of a of a of a CEO president is is fascist because it's like this male leader figure that fits into all these tropes. It's kind of like just intuitively, if somebody says they want a CEO president, they mean like, oh, I want somebody who's like going to be good about money, or you know, like I want somebody who's not going to who's going to fire people if they do a bad job. I mean, or something they might like be that. wrong, but it's not fascist. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I don't politically, I don't, I don't find the CEO president line very convincing, but like, I just, I know who I'm talking to when they say that. Um, and the interesting thing was Stanley responded and some of his responses to my review were good on Twitter. One of the things was um, th that I found confusing was he was talking about. So one thing I write in my review is um, there's a lot of points in the book where Stanley's like, well, it seems like under my definition, this like, you know, this uh, African nationalist movement should have been called a fascist movement. But let me explain how I can keep from calling them fascist under my definition. Um, and the main point in my review was like, look how ad hoc all of those moves are to just try and make sure that you're not calling any of the people you like or any of the good people who are oppressed fascist and just, you know, just coordinating off these little areas for the people who you're trying to keep this label from applying to. Um, and my impression of his response to me was that he had completely misunderstood my objection. He thought I was making the objection that his definition would have to call these people fascist and they're not. So that to me showed me that, he had probably only ever discussed this book with like left-wing scholars who were very concerned about not calling the good people fascist and making sure that only the bad people are called fascist. Um, and so that to me does show that there's, there's a potential for, for going down the wrong road when you're, obviously writing a book that is ideological and has an ideological purpose. Um, yeah. So I, I definitely it's, agree it's, with you about that, but I think scholarship, it's scholarship 
being used as propaganda, right? I mean, it's right. essentially, and, 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 you know, we know from Which history. Which is interesting because he has a book, How Propaganda Works, and propaganda is one of the fascist planks that he talks about, so. Um, but, I mean, it's just, it just, um, it's, it's, it worries me when, look, if you're doing philosophy correctly, anytime you set out to start on a project, it should be entirely possible that you wind up exactly in the opposite position that you expected right. to, right? I would suggest that it is 100% predictable exactly what every single Jason Stanley book is going to say, depending on the topic it's on, right? Matter of fact, I could tell you before he even writes it what it's going to say, right? And I guess I don't know his work in like epistemology and philosophy. No, no, no. I mean on the I'm, yeah, oh, you but, mean on the but you mean on the political. I'm sure he does yeah. tons of work that has no political valence at all. I'm not talking uh -huh. about that. I'm not talking about that. And my point is that shouldn't be possible, right? Yeah. Um, um, I mean, I, you know, I shouldn't be able to every time I pick up a piece by Rachel McKinnon already know what it's going to say before I fucking read it, right? Yeah. And that tells me that they're not doing in honestly engaged in honest scholarship. What they're doing is they're engaged in propaganda. They're doing politics and using the academic veneer to try to give it a kind of credibility where otherwise it would simply have to slug it out with all the other people in the political arena. But now you get an extra sort of rhetorical boost right? by being able to, you know, so now Rachel McKinnon can call herself an expert. Right. Because well, she course, publishes yeah. all these propaganda pieces in academic journals and places that will accept uh -huh. them because they are compromised too. Right. Yeah, the it's definitely boards are compromised. There's definitely people should worry about the sort of credibility that's being conferred on certain people in the discipline. I mean, I'll tell you what worries me or what upsets me. I think about when I think about what is it the philosophers do well? Right? What could we be imparting to the public discourse? Well, you read a good philosophy paper or even not even not like a good one, just like a standard philosophy paper, it'll say something like, "Here's like my very clear statement of this view." Here's my very clear statement of the competing view. Here's the sort of, like, here are the sort of considerations that would weigh in favor of one view or the other. Um, and it seems to me that that could be, like, such a nice thing to have in political discourse these days. To just be like, let's lay out very calmly what are the positions, what do they rely on, what's the background. Um, and very little of this public political engagement of this nature. and. I will also just say a fascinating thing is it's mostly not political philosophers who do this, right? Like it's, it's, it's from the perspective of like the, the feminist metaphysics or the, the political epistemology, the political philosophy of language. Um, but it could be so useful just to have like, okay, if I'm a fascist, what is it that I believe about like what propositions do I do I assert that the non-fascist disagrees with? And let's show that the propositions that the fascist asserts are false, right? Like that's what you would think of a normal philosophy paper about fascism as doing. Um, look, I mean, look, there is a masterpiece in the genre. It's Hannah Arendt's Origins of right. Alternism. And go ahead and read that, and then go ahead and read Jason Stanley's book, right? And 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 you know you don't even need to explain the difference, right? I mean, you can, it's just demonstrable. You can see it. Um, 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 look, I have to assume that Jason Stanley is perfectly aware of the actual history. I think he just counts on the fact that nobody else is, right? And so and so he can just go ahead and and pull those Mussolini things and stuff out of context, and just sort of assume that nobody's going to bother to find out. Or that nobody will know that Peter Ludlow went to the trouble. Yeah, those were rough. And let me just say, I mean, it's very interesting that it's Ludlow. He, it's like it's, he's, it's he's either he either doesn't know the history, in which case he shouldn't be writing the book, or he's just lying. Right. Or he's just lying on purpose, right? I mean, he's just deliberately misleading the reader for the sake of being able to have an academically credentialed book that you can now wave in the air when you tell everybody that Republicans are fascists, right? Yeah. I that mean, bothers I, me. I, that, that, that seems to be a misuse of our trade. This is not what we do, right? 
I definitely, I don't necessarily want to spend too much time. Right, Jason has been very nice to me. No, no, I, I I, I'm using it as an example because it's recent. But you could pull out any book you like could, that. You could you use know. a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. there would yeah. be a lot of examples. Um, an interesting. So I wonder if you saw this. This was an interesting episode. And again, I don't want to name names, but there was a, a youngish professor who posted his intro to philosophy syllabus on the Daily News. Which yes, was I remember that. that. Yeah, I'm yeah, gonna, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach intro to philosophy in the following way, and he had like a section on epistemic injustice, a section on slurring, like a, a section on speech act. It was all like social things. justice related. It was all the most, the most social justice yeah, yeah. stuff. Um, and I wonder how you feel about because that's not even like there's there, there's one thing about you know, a book that became very popular and like um, my, my mom called me and said, uh, oh, you know, is Jason Stanley the guy whose book reviewed? He, and I was like, yeah. And she said, oh, he's on Morning Joe right now. You know, so that's very public and so forth. But what about the, like, there's so much that's not public and just inside the discipline yeah. of developing these theories and <clears throat> especially in epistemology and in the philosophy of language, but to to an extent, even in metaphysics, you have this feminist metaphysics movement. Um, you have feminist philosophy of science. Um, and the idea that somebody would now, that it's now possible to design a course just out of these incredibly kind of like blinkered and politically univocal subfields. And one-sided. I mean, if I recall exactly. that, yeah, one -sided. If I recall that syllabus, there's no engagement with any literature that would be critical of that literature. No. And uh -huh. it's not clear to me, like, it's not clear to me how much critical literature there is, because as you said, a lot of people just look at this stuff and they say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deal with that. Like, maybe if you talk to me, you know, of course, if you talk to the average philosopher, maybe they think the literature on this new use of speech act theory or this idea of epistemic injustice, maybe they think that that's nonsense, but it's not like they're going to write a paper taking it down because they don't want to. They don't want to disturb the hornet's nest, and also it's not their area. Their area is, you know, S25 logics, or it's, you know, Plato or whatever, right? Um, but but see, that's, why, that's why I worry about the corrupting of the actual the uh -huh. discipline, because, you see, what they've done is, if speech, if language and speech now is violence, then to simply write a critical article as far as they're concerned, they will say this is like assaulting someone. Well, that's what people said about the Tuvel article, right? And we right. had a lot of, and a lot of these concerns came up with Tuvel. I remember having this argument on Daily News where people said, "Look, Oliver, it's not about an ideology; it's about making sure that the experts have, you know, the experts in fields like critical race theory and gender theory have a chance to weigh in. But expertise, like expertise in those areas." is explicitly like conflated with the right political perspective, right? right. So you can't, you can't. It's not the person who has read, read and wrote the most. It's the person who has the right view. That's the expert. exactly right. And you can't be, and it, I mean, I, and it's amazing the discussions. And again, like this is actually negative about somebody we talked positively about before, but some of the discussions you see online about these things, like the whole, in terms of the 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 politics of feminism and and transgender stuff, um, there was this exchange between uh, I have two people I forget who, but um, and it was basically this back and forth about whether the word turf was a slur, right? Whether you know, and um, it just seemed to me to be so like orthogonal to what the actual philosophical issues are. like. Take a stance on what gender is and, uh, and yeah. show that that's the right stance yeah. and show how the other person's ideas do not fit into that. Um, but I think, I, think I, th I know I agree. I wanted to say on, for the record that I agree with you. I think that, that Kathleen, and we're talking about Kathleen Stock, and yeah. the people on her side, the gender critical side, are making a fundamental mistake by fighting this out in the same way that their opponents are by, by just yelling misogynist back. Right. Yeah. So these people, the yell, these people are yelling no transphobe, yeah. and they're yelling back misogynist. And then whoever's going to win is going to be, who's got the most people yelling, I guess. Yeah. Um, and, and whoever the, the, the people in positions of power are the most afraid of. 
and that's not the territory that that philosophers should ever. Yeah, that I always on. thought that was the opposite of how <laughs> philosophy worked, right? I, when I think of philosophy, yeah, I think I oh, agree with you. Someday somebody's going to make me drink poison, right? <laughs> like that's what look, they do. Like that's what they the same do. Thing with the, look, this is the same thing though with the, with 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 liberals. I mean, classical liberals and people on, and conservatives now engaging in identity politics themselves, right? I mean, I mean, I mean to listen to you know Trumpites. Yeah, employ identity uh, politics arguments to me is just like you know what well, you can't you know you can't out of one side of your mouth say that oh we have this terrible problem in America and it's identity politics and you know we should we should be you know judging people as individuals and all that and then just employ the same tactics in reverse right I mean I mean I mean look I understand yeah. at a certain level that politics is a dirty game but I mean there comes a point at which there's no difference between you and your opponent right, anymore. I mean, yeah. Or people, and this happens with people in my sphere. If you've been going around for years saying we need to find a better way to deal with this disagreement, we need to learn to listen to people who disagree with us. We need to take disagreement seriously to then, if you then go and say now, you know, now that I'm winning, Oh, if you disagree with me, you're an SJW, you know, that's not, that's not very satisfying. And, uh, you know, the, I think it's true of so many groups that, that the principles fall apart once they have power um, because they were partly a rhetorical device used, you know, used to position themselves to get power. I guess the ease um, with which you, you do, you engage in that sort of thing is an indicator of, how disingenuous you were to begin with, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess it's sort of you know, it's very disappointing. Um, um, and uh, but we're we're talking specifically about philosophy, and right. I guess yeah. the worry that I have is that that and, and we're we're getting past an hour, so I want to sort of wind this down. Mm. The worry that I have is, look, if this was just you know some people, even prominent people, doing this. I would say, okay, it's a phase, blah, 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 it'll pass, you know, we just have to, you know, enough of us have to just keep doing good work and da 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 da, da. But th what worries me is that it seems to me that these people have pretty much captured all of the institutions, right? In other words... You're talking about like the APA. So the American Philosophical Association, that's the sort of the, to the extent to which we have a, 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 a governing, a governing yeah. body, they're it. And... It seems to me they're very, they very clearly have been captured by this, by this uh, ideological, politicized sort of uh, uh, posture mentality. Um, just to very quickly summarize, people can find this out for themselves, and I, I, I published some pieces on it. Um, Brian Leiter did a series on it. But, um, you know, you look at the projects they fund, the grants that they give, 95% of them are some of the, some of the minutely fine grain social justice projects. Mm -hmm. You look at their blog, nine out of 10 of the, of, of the posts are social justice related. I mean, you just go count them, right? Yep. You look at the statements they issue. I mean, everything you look at, you look at the sort of internal committees they have, you look at all this sort of stuff and you just, mm -hmm. again, you have to be fundamentally dishonest to suggest that it's not right. That it's not politicized that it's not skewed completely in a single direction. I look at the major, the, the, the big people who are, you know, out in the social media slash blog world, you know, Brian Leiter is sort of by himself, mm -hmm. although he's probably the most uh, powerful in that sphere. Right. Because he publishes the, the, the Gourmet Report, which, which mm -hmm. is the only credible ranking system we have, whatever you may think of it. It's all we got. And uh, when you talk to people in other disciplines where there's none, they'll tell you they wish they had one, right? Right. For all its faults, you, they'll tell you they wish they had one. And I used to have pretty mixed feelings about it myself, and I've pretty much come around to thinking that. It's um, just nice to have, you know. Unless you have a better op alternative, yeah. I'm glad we have it, right? But aside from him, it seems to me the other major players and the other biggest player after him is, 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 is Weinberg, Justin Weinberg. Right. And, you know, I used to think that he was, you know, obviously very progressively oriented and partisan personally, but that he was relatively fair, that he, that he took seriously his role as a major, as a major 
um, um, uh, figure in the public intellectual sphere, right? Um, that, 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 he, that, that he took seriously his role as a curator of a website that is heavily trafficked by professional philosophers and that has a, quite a bit of influence in the, in the discipline. Mm. And I've sadly, I had him on the show. I, you know, I thought we got along really well. But he behaved towards me in such a brutal and partisan and really um, um, disgusting fashion in Daily News that I, I kind of, I finally decided, I, I emailed him privately and told him that I would not be commenting there anymore and that I thought the way he treated me was really despicable and unfair. Um, but I decided that he really, he really is, is, is not, an, uh, not an honest broker and that he's not, he's not curating that site in a way that's, uh, in my view, responsible given, uh, given its role in the discipline. And so I guess I did, and then I had to see what's going on in departments. I see things like the Tuvel situation and stuff, you know, and you see the people on the editorial boards who are doing this and you start getting a picture that I don't know how, you know, our discipline survives mm -hmm. with all of its chief institutions captured by these activists, these very, very mercenary activists. And at a time when the humanities in general are in decline, and, yeah. and are, are having to justify themselves, oftentimes in states where there is no sympathy to this political orientation. I mean, right. in, 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 where I am in Missouri, this is a death blow. I mean, you can kiss philosophy goodbye if it ever becomes identified with this sort of thing. Right. Forget it. And so I guess that's why I'm really worried. Now, you're not as worried. And I, 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 wish, I want you to, 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 to help me not be as worried. Well, I, I might not look worried, but I honestly, I haven't really thought about it. That's just my face. You know. and, you I have I'm wrong I in characterizing the capture of the institutions. You think I'm not right about this? No, I. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm. I'm very new at all this. I don't. I don't. I've never been to a philosophy conference. You know, like I don't necessarily know. I don't know what stature the APA has. Uh, I don't know what. I'll tell you something on Daily News that that gives me some hope. Um, and this is something that I appreciate that Justin does, although maybe now that I'm saying it, he'll change it. Um, that Professor Weinberg does. Um, when there, when people make comments, you can it can be liked, you know, like on Facebook or on Twitter, you can like or upvote it or whatever. Um, and for all, I think Professor Weinberg has been sometimes very petty in the things he said to me on there, sometimes very condescending, um, but. You can always just say, look at the, compare, what's the approval for what Oliver says versus what Weinberg says. Um, and uh, it's clear to me that there is this silent majority in the discipline, and they're reading their, these blogs. They're keeping track of what's going on. Um, they're not weighing in, or some of them weigh in anonymous, anonymously, um, but in general, they're not weighing in. And I have... I often get emails or DMs when I'm when I'm commenting on Daily New. I get people con contacting me on Twitter or over email who say, um, "I'm anon three six five two one. You know, I wish I had your blah blah blah. You know, to 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 not be anonymous, but I have to worry about my job. But these people these people are out there, um, and I think what what we need to do is just we need to figure out a way to to, <laughs> in a sense, to democratize the discipline um, to, so that there's not this, this ability of the, the people who are just in philosophy in order to capture it for these, for these purposes. Um, maybe that's very utopian of me. Um, but I guess I... No, I hold no, that it's not utopian if you, can, if you can see a way to do it. I mean, look... The expression well, silent majority, right? You know, you take it, it; it's original. And what you know, the, the the reason that was potent was because they went out and voted for Nixon, who destroyed McGovern in a landslide, right? Um, um, what is the? I, I don't see the. I don't see this. The 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 the, the comparable. Yeah. What does the majority actually? How, do? how does how does the silent majority in philosophy get mustered? You know, you tried. So 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 what I tried to do. Mm -hmm. I thought I saw an opening and I talked to Brian Leiter and Leiter posted a piece that I wrote about 
changing, either developing an alternative institution to the APA or electing a slate of candidates to throw out the people running the APA. Right. And first he ran surveys. And if you looked at the survey results, overwhelmingly, people were in favor of either starting a new organization or right. of overthrowing the people who are running the current one. Um, but then when it came down to actually doing it, mm -hmm. so Brian put out a call for candidates to run because there were, there were elections for the APA slate. Right. And I, back, I, I did the same, and we both we sort of backed this. And we had all of two people contact us saying that they might be interested in doing it. And so I guess what I'm wondering is what is the, what is the comparable process by which the silent majority in philosophy, like the silent majority in America, which, which, uh, which elected Nixon in a landslide um, is going to change the situation in philosophy. And the reason I ask is simply because it seems to me that there's one major lack of comparable uh, comparableness. And that is right. that philosophy is much more, uh, much more institutionally hierarchical, right? I mean, it's in many ways an aristocratic sort of system. Right. I mean, look, which is, which is ironic that the progressives are taking advantage of the, of the hierarchy and the system. Well, yeah. And I mean, look, and also even you were One talking many before about experts. I mean, I think it's very ironic that the inheritors of the so Socratic tradition would claim expertise on anything. Right. I mean, every time I watch Rachel, I see Rachel McKinnon yelling about how she's an expert. I, I just try to imagine Socrates um, saying he's an expert, right? I mean, I'm mean, <laughs> wondering if she's ever read any uh, soccer, any, any of yeah. any Plato's dialogue. But, you know, the, 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 the problem is, is that I just don't see the analogy to the voters. <laughs> right. In philosophy, and philosophy is aristocratic. I mean, look, you have a, what I take to be the number one most scandalous thing currently in our profession has nothing to do with politics. Mm -hmm. has to do with uh, a job opportunity. So you currently have a situation. Uh, someone told me that Barnard has a position, has over 500 applicants. I'm chairing a search committee right now. We had over 150 applicants, and my school is a nothing place in, the, right. in terms of philosophy, right? Right. It's not on anybody's want to, want to really want to work their list, Okay. So if we're getting 150, Barnard's getting 500. I can't even imagine what Princeton's getting. I can't even imagine what MIT's getting. It is yeah, I well think I heard at Notre Dame we get close to 1,000. Right. It is well known. Right. This is well known. So the obvious remedy, the obvious thing to do is, to, is a moratorium on new PhDs. Right? You simply have to stop producing PhDs until the ones who are already in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's just wrong. Right. It's just flat out wrong to do okay now you tr now you float this idea this also was an argument that, that went on on lighter that the answer i got was so appalling that i had to write a whole essay on it mm -hmm. the answer i got from david velleman who's a former professor of mine when i was at the university of michigan now he's at that he's at that um um a mega mega corp uh, philosophy corp known as NYU, right? Um, He's one of the uh, ones who wrote the letter against letter, right? The, right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is what was Velleman's answer? Oh, that's not possible. Um, uh, we, we, we need them for teaching, right? What about, what about all the... Wait a minute. The reason they need them for teaching is so the reason they need them for teaching is so that the Velleman's don't have to do any, right? Right. So wh why don't they want to do any? Because they so that they can publish 150 articles in a career, right? Why would I want 150 articles from David Velleman? I have no idea, right? <laughs> how many how many writings did I get from J.L. Austin? What four, right? I want 150 from David Velleman, right? No, the point is, we, the top people in our our discipline are such a bunch of of delusional narcissists, right? They actually think that what they're doing is so important that it justifies employing essentially indentured servants, right? Yeah, I do think And these are people who claim to be liberal. They claim to be progressive. They'll go out and they'll criticize you for being... And meanwhile, they're essentially operating 
like some 17th century you know, who brought people yeah. over on a ship, right? And said, you can spend the rest of your life working it off, right? I mean, it's unbelievable. What I'll tell you what depresses me. Our just, is our, that, our APA is doing nothing about it, right? So how mean, do you get people? We couldn't get any takers, right? I mean, I mean, everybody knows this. Lighter's poll showed that huge percent of majorities wanted mm -hmm. this to be changed. When we actually went out to try and and get people to to run for the offices to get to chuck out the people who are currently running the APA, two people. Well, nobody nobody wants to take these sorts of chances. I mean, philosophers. It's crazy to me. Philosophers are so. Like I told you, I dropped out of law school, but it seems to me philosophers are more risk averse than lawyers. You know, the risk aversion is off the charts. Where there's um, no money at stake, they're really risk. Yeah, there's, it's, what is what is even at stake? It's a funny thing to me is. Well, I'll tell you what, what depresses me about the, the, the main negative. You talked about how I think going at Notre Dame. There's a lot of positives. I really enjoy every, everybody there is very smart. The sad thing is just seeing, and these kids are younger than me. Like the people who are just finishing their PhDs, a lot of them are younger than me because I'm, you know, I'm 31. I took all this time off. I did all these yeah. various things yeah. or also spent a lot of years just not doing anything at all. Um, so you have a kid who maybe, you know, was so smart in college and went off to this very good PhD program and spent five years there, you know, grinding away on these abstruse topics because somebody told him or her that these were the important things in life, right? Some, somebody older, some authority figure told them this is what's important in life is to study whether the grounds grounds the grounded or whatever. Um, and, uh, now I see them going on the job market and they talk to me and they say, I don't know, Oliver, maybe I should apply to law school or I don't know, Oliver, maybe I should learn to code. And it's just like, this was their twenties. Like this was their twenties that went away in this enterprise of academic philosophy, um, where they were told that the good things in life are these very abstruse technical topics and to try to get publications in, in these top journals, which by the way, you know, like if I read a, you know, a random article in Phil review or news or mind, a lot of them aren't that good, especially oh, they're not. From, the more, from the more established people. It's like, how did you, how did this even, you know, a lot of them just fall apart on examination. Well, that's another that's another dirty little secret, which I happen to know because I was managing editor of a of a of a of a pretty uh, relatively uh, you know major mm -hmm. journal for years. And um, the dirty little secret is the famous people's stuff does not get peer reviewed. The yeah, same. you just just goes through. I mean, I know this from this is the way it, it was. Could, it, it, it would yeah. be mathematically impossible for them, some of them, to publish at the rate that they do, going given what the normal turnaround times are if they were going through the normal process. Yeah. I, by the way, pointed this out also, and Velleman denied it. Now, I happen to know it's true because I've seen it from the inside. Yeah. I've, I've seen it. I've, I've, yeah. It's been told to me, oh, that one's going in, right? I mean, It's I, amazing. I, it's amazing to me that someone would deny that. It's just like, <laughs> people that, just to me, that to me seems like patently, patently obvious that that goes on. So, um, I mean, you know, I, I, we're in a situation where uh, we should finish it on this note. I mean, yeah. I'll let you have the last word. It seems like we're in a situation where we have sort of two major problems. I mean, the first is and it's two types of capture, right? I mean, first of all, the leading people and the leading institutions are ideologically captured. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that they also are um, uh, uh, captured by self-interest. In other words, the, it's become essentially now let's depend, let's defend our mm -hmm. corner of the fiefdom here. It's fine if all these marginal philosophy programs in the Midwest and who knows where the fuck they are go down the toilet. We're just going to make sure that, you know, we, you know, NYU stay, you know, there is, there is such a concentration of talent in such a small number of places. And these places, the departments are not in any jeopardy at all. And the major, the only institutional organization is captured by those people. And so that's why you're not, a groundswell is not going to work. With an election, it doesn't matter what the institutions and organizations say. If Joe Schmo walks out of his house and goes in the voting booth and vote for Nixon, that's a vote for Nixon. It doesn't work like that with us. Yeah. And, and unless somebody 
is unless we are willing to sort of take over the APA, I don't think this is going to change at all. I think it's actually going to get more. It's going to get more condensed. It's going to mm -hmm. get even purer. And it's just going to be out the rest that are just going to just going to slowly disappear, right? I mean, you know, uh, programs like mine, programs all across the country are just going to vanish. And then you'll have, you know, 20 programs in these, in right. these major places where all the people are. And that's all they're going to be, right? Um, um, and I, I just, I don't see, I don't see the way out of this now. I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm really at the point of kind of despairing about it. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason I'm doing so much public intellectual work now is I just don't see any future in philosophy anymore. Right. Um, um, I don't know. You know, I'm, it's probably unfair to ask you that, right? I mean, you know, given that. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a little out of my depth here <laughs> just because I haven't finished my first semester. Um, you know, well, never you were in graduate long school long. at Tufts, and you. I was at Tufts, yeah. And you're participating um, a lot in in the online discussion, so I mean, you're seeing what's going on. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, I, I try to be savvy, you know, a lot of people, I talk to the other first years in my program and of course, and this is understandable. They're all like, Oh, Oliver, I'm just getting settled. I don't want to worry about all that. And I'm telling them, you know, like you got to be thinking now about how am I going to be getting a job in a few years? You know, you, this is adult life. Now you want to be thinking about publications. Are they aware of how bad the market is? This your fellow students. I mean, do they understand what it means for there to be 600 applicants for a job? I don't think, I think that like, they, they they put it off as like really bad, but they're thinking like I will cross that bridge when I come to it. Whereas for me, I know, and this is one thing that was good about law school, that people there were very pragmatic, very practical. I'm thinking about it from the perspective of like, I don't, you know, I have all these professors and like maybe I get an A minus or a B plus in some course because Professor Joe Schmo thinks the argument I made against his paper was not a good argument, but I don't really care, right? Like I need to be thinking about like, publishing things, presenting at conferences, making my name, you know, yeah. getting some sort of profile that would be, that would set me out, you know, that would, that would distinguish me from the other 600 applicants. Hence the um, worthwhileness of taking the risk you're taking. I mean, exactly. yes. that's what makes a high risk, high reward in terms of, in terms of what you said before, I think it's very true. Um, and I would just say, and I think this is a point that Brian Leiter made when you had him on too, or Brian Leiter. Um, what? isn't it interesting how these two kinds of captures are going on at the same time and there's no conflict between them, right? Isn't it interesting how the progressive political capture is so convenient for the kind of professionalization um, that, that comes with the APA. Um, and this is something you hear from kind of heterodox leftists a lot, you know, like, like an Adolf Reed or somebody like that. Yeah, that's um, it's sort of, it's, the yeah. argument is that it's kind of a neoliberal. Yeah, exactly. Isn't it amazing how they're really the not very left wing like, at all? <laughs> yeah, it, it's like a corporate human resources department. Yeah, um, and that that syllabus that that introduction to philosophy syllabus that was supposed to be so groundbreaking and so left wing, uh, isn't it amazing? how useful that would be for somebody working in human resources at, yeah. you know, at, a, at an enormous corporation. Yeah. So that's, that's the note that I, I want to end it on a surprisingly left wing note. For me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, that's an interesting point. And I think it's right. And um, I don't think there's any, I, I don't see how somebody can claim to be genuinely left wing and preside over a discipline that deliberately and cynically and explicitly s exploits labor. I just yeah. don't see. I just don't see how. And of basically uh, of kids. Yeah, and and exploits what essentially are are very young people. Um, um, and um, uh, uh, thus 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 violating the roles of stewardship and all sorts of other just things beyond left wing left right consideration. Yeah. Um, Oliver, uh, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Yeah, I had a lot of fun talking to you. Hopefully, I didn't take us on too many tangents. No, no, no. It's 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 it, it, it actually we covered everything I wanted to talk about. Good. And um, in in a more organic way, rather than you know, oh, well, let's talk about this next. Uh -huh. And I'm hoping that in we'll do some more in the future, and maybe we'll actually talk about philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. And not uh, about I, this I'll, stuff. I'll, I'll try and learn something about philosophy first. So <laughs> learn about some of philosophy that we can talk about. <laughs> All right, my friend. Well, take care of yourself, and thank you very much. Yeah, have a great afternoon. Enjoy your Saturday. And have a happy holiday. Yeah, you too.